This video consists of two different speeches former President Valentine Strasser made from 1992 to 1995. In both of those speeches he highlights the various plans he had for Sierra Leone. Looking back at the unfortunate civil war that took place after, we must ask ourselves as a people, how did it come to this? How did the Sierra Leone Strasser envision turn out like present day Sierra Leone? We must also ask ourselves did we learn from our mistakes in the past? Or are the atrocities in present day Ceylon a reoccurring cycle of our past haunting us? These two speeches not only offer a new perspective on Strasser's short presidency but also offer insight into the steps we could have taken as a nation and people. Mr. President, Mr. Secretary General, Excellencies, Distinguished Delegates, it is with a deep sense of humility that I ascend this podium and bring you greetings and best wishes from the people of Sierra Leone as we approach the close of one of the most momentous years in our recent history. Permit me to convey to you, Mr. President, warm felicitations on your election to the presidency of the 47th session of the General Assembly. Your election is a tribute to your country and a testimony of its faith in this organization and all that it stands for. I wish you success in the execution of your duties. Mr. President, the year 1992 witnessed the accession to membership of our organization of a record number of 13 states, thus bringing closer the attainment of the goal of universality envisaged in the Charter. To all of these new members, Sierra Leone extends a warm hand of welcome and friendship, feeling sure that together we shall cooperate in forging a new era of peace and progress and a better life for all the peoples of the world. Mr. President, distinguished delegates, since Sierra Leone was admitted the hundredth member of this organization some 30 years ago, we have come to regard this organization as the custodian of international peace and security and as a bastion for the defense, sovereignty, and territorial integrity of all states, but particularly small states such as ours. At the same time, this organization has not failed to deploy yeoman's efforts and solving the many international problems of an economic, social, cultural, and humanitarian character which continue to plague us. In spite of all that may have been said and done, the United Nations and the cause of its relatively short history has not only contributed in preventing the nightmare of a nuclear war, but has also made an invaluable contribution in eliminating those other scourges which have afflicted and continue to afflict mankind since time immemorial. 
Sierra Leone is indeed very grateful for the unstinting all-round support it has received from this organization and its specialized agencies in confronting these problems. I wish once again to pay tribute to all those noble men and women who in the name of the United Nations and its agencies have participated in the socio-economic development of our country in the eradication of diseases, in caring for the needs of our children, and giving help and succor to our refugees and displaced persons. Sierra Leone owes a debt of gratitude to them all. Regrettably, the problem of poverty and underdevelopment have continued to have a direct bearing on our country. It is also a matter of regret that despite the assistance received from this organization over the years, Sierra Leone has not registered the necessary economic growth and development which should have brought about a fundamental and meaningful improvement in the standards of life of its people. The past 24 years witnessed a decline in the socio-economic fabric of our nation, resulting in tremendous hardship and suffering for our people. Though the reasons for this are manifold and complex, in the case of our country, however, one of the principal causes has been the succession of bad governments which conspired against our people neglected their welfare, and when not sharing the national wealth amongst themselves, conspired with foreign elements to dispose of our natural resources at giveaway prices, thereby depriving Sierra Leoneans of an improved standard of life and reducing them to second-class citizens in their own God-given land. Mr. President, distinguished delegates. Amid this nightmarish experience, Sierra Leoneans wondered what really went wrong with their country. Endowed as it is with both rich natural and human resources, a country that was once referred to as the Athens of West Africa, given its rich educational and cultural heritage. Over the last 24 years, Sierra Leone experienced such far-reaching decline in its socio-economic fabric that the average life expectancy of Sierra Leoneans was reduced to only 42 years, with one in four children dying before the age of five due to malnutrition and other diseases. With vital surgical operations carried out in constant fear of breakdown of electricity supply, with teachers forced to frequently withdraw their services for non payment of salaries, trying to eke out a living other than by teaching, with the capital city itself in perennial darkness for years because the government had failed to make provision for electricity supply. All of these leading to the concomitant and inexorable decline in the national production and the standard of living of our fellow countrymen. While the external factors contributing to this decline cannot be denied, the truth of the matter is that the incompetence and malpractices of the previous government had so permitted all facets of national life that the nation was left to drift without any sense of direction. Thus, instead of economic development, there was a national slide into poverty 
and economic malaise. It was as if the light had gone out of the nation's life with no one in charge to rekindle it. As if that we are not enough, as distinguished members are aware, last year, as a result of the civil war which had been raging in Liberia, at a time when Liberians had turned against each other, engaging themselves in an orgy of massacre, the people of Sierra Leone opened their rooms and schools to them and offered them sanctuary in order to end the killings and consequent suffering which they had to endure and in the absence of any semblance of government in that country, the states of the sub-region, including Sierra Leone, with great reluctance and purely on humanitarian grounds, decided to send the peacekeeping force the Economic Community Monitoring Group, or ECOMOG, to Liberia to stop the carnage and bring the fighting among the various factions to an end. It was because Sierra Leone provided a base for the ECOMOG peacekeeping force in Liberia that Mr. Charles Steeler and his band of NPFL rebels launched a premeditated and unwarranted invasion against our country. This senseless act of revenge was also motivated by the fact that Taylor had been denied the use of our territory to infiltrate arms and ammunition to prolong the conflict in Liberia. Thus, because we allowed our country to be used to bring peace to Liberia, we now have a war imposed on us. In the cause of this act of perfidy, many innocent lives, including those of women and children, have been needlessly lost. The national economy lay in ruins as no meaningful agricultural and mining activities could be undertaken in the areas of rebel activity. Mr. President, distinguished delegates, the cost of this imposed war for Sierra Leone and its people has been incalculable and agonizing. As custodian of international peace and security, this organization cannot sit idly by while a group of armed bandits let loose as a result of a total breakdown of law and order in a neighboring state, continue to engage on a campaign of terror and destabilization of the whole sub-region. On behalf of the people of Sierra Leone, I appeal, strongly appeal, to this august body for its economic, military, and diplomatic support to once and for all eliminate this cancer, which, if not stopped in its track, could lead to further destabilization and insecurity in the whole sub-region. The government and people of Sierra Leone expect and deserve such support, especially when facing a mortal danger launched from without. We hold Mr. Charles Taylor responsible for the suffering Sierra Leoneans have had to endure as a result of his acts of murder, 
banditry and international lawlessness. But my country need not have been left so exposed and unprepared for such acts of aggression. Our people need not have suffered such a deal. If only the previous government had taken its responsibilities seriously. If only the necessary material and logistic support had been provided for the armed forces to repel such aggression. The previous regime again failed miserably to meet these challenges. Mr. President, not only did the previous government breach its social contract with the people and neglect their welfare, but it also failed to safeguard the territorial integrity of the nation. These factors impelled us as patriots in the armed forces to intervene in a bloodless takeover on the 29th April this year and set up the National Provisional Ruling Council to save our nation from further catastrophe. Herein lies the legitimacy of our action. We intervened because we saw no way out of our affliction, no future to match the sacrifice our people had been asked to make over many years. In assuming such onerous responsibility, my colleagues and I had no personal ambition to assume power for its own sake. We saw it as our patriotic duty to take bold and forthright action to save our beloved country from the political economic, social, and moral decline, which had engulfed it. As patriots, we felt we could not stand idly by and watch the total collapse of our nation. We had to act to put a country back on the rails of socioeconomic development and to restore its moral fiber. As was a very popular move, a case of unrepentant patriotism, as evidenced by the mass support we received then and have continued to receive today. But our action, by our action, our fellow citizens have once more found strength and inspiration. Once more, the light in them has started to spark and rekindle. Notwithstanding such popular approval and the efforts we have exerted to rehabilitate and reconstruct the socio-economic fabric of our nation, let me declare from this tribune that the government of the National Provisional Ruling Council has not come to stay in power. In the several decrees and proclamations issued since we assumed management of the affairs of the nation, we made our intentions and objectives quite clear. They remain the same. Firstly, to bring to an end the rebel war imposed against a country and to rehabilitate the devastated war areas. Secondly, to put the beleaguered economy of our country on a sound and solid foundation. Thirdly, to take all measures necessary for the recovery of all financial resources lawfully belonging to government. And finally, to relaunch the democratic process on a just, fair, and lasting basis. Applause 
With regard to the Liberian invasion, my government is employing all the resources at its disposal to ensure that our gallant soldiers who are defending the nation at the war front carry out their duties in the proper spirit and atmosphere. Not only are the proper logistics being provided for them, but also their material welfare is being assured. But alas, against a weak economy such as ours, and facing an aggressor that receives armed support from a country in our continent, which sees it as its mission, the carrying out of revolutionary warfare, and the spread of instability in the various regions of our continent and beyond in the name of revolutionary ideals. My country should not be left alone to face such foreign onslaught. Hence, my plea to this organization for the necessary military, economic, and diplomatic support to repel the invaders. The war has continued to attract attention at international gatherings. At the recent ECOWA summit held in Dakar, for example, a far-reaching communique was adopted by the heads of state which, among other things, gave Charles Taylor and his fellow rebels one month to fully comply with the Yamasukro Agreement, which contains as an important element the creation of a buffer zone between Liberia and Sierra Leone. Failing such compliance, all countries of the sub-region would be required to impose sanctions against him and his armed bandits. We call upon the international community to lend full support to the efforts of ECOWAS and the OAU to bring these senseless and reckless acts of banditry to a speedy conclusion. On the question of the rehabilitation of the devastated areas of the war, my government has adopted definitive measures that will be put in place as soon as peace returns to those areas. In this connection, a National Rehabilitation Committee has been set up to oversee this particular matter. It is for us a source of comfort that the international community stands ready to support us with a rehabilitation exercise as soon as the right atmosphere prevails. Insofar as the second objective regarding the vitalization of our sick and battered economy is concerned, my government has continued to be guided by the understanding reached with the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund. My government has demonstrated its determination to keep the International Monetary Fund program on course. The new 1992-1993 budget, which was recently adopted, was framed with this particular aim in view. The signs are that we shall succeed. A dynamic program for the collection of government taxes and dues has been launched by the Department of Finance, and weekly as well as monthly revenue, revenue returns show that effective work is now going on to harness all financial resources due government. The Department of Trade and the Armed Forces have taken effective steps to ensure that our basic commodities are not taken out of the country illegally, as was the rampant practice in the past. Naturally, the undertakings subscribed to by our government have not been easy to implement in terms of the weak nature of the economy and the suffering which it imposes on our people. Nevertheless, the NPRC government is determined to see through the program because of its awareness 
that only with success in this difficult endeavor can we hope to achieve meaningful economic salvation and progress in the near future. On the objective relating to the relaunching of the democratic process in Sierra Leone, the NPRC family believes that a democratic system of government can only operate within certain parameters which, if absent, will abort that process sooner or later. When the National Provisional Ruling Council assumed the reins of government, it also inherited an unresponsive bureaucracy which had aided and abetted the political system that had ruined the socio-economic fabric of our society. The NPRC government therefore found it necessary as a first step to embark on a cleaning up exercise to provide the basis for building a sustainable democratic system. For reasons of national security, some people have had to be taken into protective custody while they are being naturally investigated. All such persons are being well treated and investigated in accordance with internationally accepted standards. They have been allowed access to their lawyers. The International Committee of the Red Cross and Amnesty International have been allowed to make regular visits. Recently, 18 Liberian nationals who had been detained for alleged rebel activities were released. The various commissions of inquiry set up to investigate the detainees, among others, have remained impartial. Those found innocent will immediately be released, while those with cases to answer will face an open and impartial trial. I wish to reiterate here that the NPRC government is committed to the rule of law and to the fundamental human rights and freedoms of the individual. As an indication of our commitment to the democratic process, the NPRC has established an advisory council made up of eminent citizens from various walks of life and of proven integrity to advise the government on the restoration of the democratic process. The principal task of this council will be to work out the modalities for returning the country to genuine multi-party democracy in the light of our national experience and within the shortest time possible. Since assuming office four months ago, the NPRC has brought about a completely new framework and spirit within which affairs of the state and government are conducted. In the first place, a new drive has been launched to generate total commitment, dedication, and efficiency on the part of all government and state functionaries. Sierra Leoneans generally are being made to be aware they should see themselves as first-class citizens in their own country, and that the potentials of their country in terms of economic and natural resources can only be honest to the full through hard work, honesty, and dedication on their part. We have attempted to liberate Sierra Leoneans from shame, restore their vision of what our country should be, and for every citizen to enjoy the fruits of ease or our labor. In spite of our youth, we believe we have demonstrated that capacity for leadership, that concern for our nation's welfare, which previous governments had failed to provide our country in the last 24 years. The youthfulness of the NPRC government therefore should not be held against us 
or made a reason for not extending economic assistance to our country. After a long period of darkness and neglect, the men, women, and children of Sierra Leone deserve the support of the international community. Mr. President, we in Sierra Leone continue to view with dismay the unfavorable international economic environment, the continuing denial of access to a greater market share for our exports, the gradual decline in export earnings, and the inability still to meet the target for official development assistance not to talk of the shortfall in real terms of such assistance. Coupled with the high percentage of our gross domestic product diverted to debt servicing, each year it has been reported the countries of sub-Saharan Africa struggle to pay about one-third of it the interest due on their debt of $150 billion. The rest is added to the rising mountain of debt under which the hope of the continent lies buried. The fact of the matter is, Mr. President, distinguished delegates, is that even the small portion of the interest which developing countries, such as mine, manage to pay is absorbing a quarter of all our export earnings and costing us each year more than our total expenditure on the health and education of our peoples. It is in the light of this that the conclusion has been drawn that all our efforts at socio-economic development would come to naught unless and until effective measures are taken to address the African debt problem, which is now an unbearable burden. While Sierra Leone continues to welcome the various initiatives that have been proposed, including those first put forward by Prime Minister Major of the United Kingdom and since developed into the Trinidad terms, and to pay tribute to those creditor countries that had been considered it necessary to cancel some of our debts, it is the widely held view, after careful study, that the present initiatives cannot even remotely be effective in achieving the objective of relieving the debt burdens sufficiently for African countries to have a reasonable chance of success in achieving structural adjustment, recovery, or growth in the foreseeable future. It therefore remains our firm conviction, Mr. President, that our plea for debt relief it's both compelling and humane, and must ends be answered. For many developing countries, especially the least developed, like Sierra Leone, negative growth has become an all-too-familiar future of economic performance, with three-digit inflation among its worst futures. Simply put, this is not a situation that can be sustained indefinitely. Invariably, the greater the stresses many of our countries are called upon to bear, the less likely it becomes for the world economy to assume its own steady growth. While the interdependence of the global economy cannot be overemphasized, the fact remained that in a global recession, the pain is all the greater for countries such as mine. It is primarily for this reason that we would hope that a new agenda for the development of Africa, adopted by this assembly last year, will attract a much greater degree of response and support than its predecessor, the United Nations Programme for Action for African economic recovery and development. 
the innovative and more positive approach which the new agenda offers should, should be seized by the international community to arrest and reverse the downward trend which the severity of the many economic and human crises have inflicted on African development. We cannot afford one more failure in this enterprise. Mr. President, serious as our domestic preoccupations are, we will be remiss if we fail to see events taking place elsewhere as important. It is in this vein that we must once again register our deep concern over the bloody violence which in recent months have been visited on the people of South Africa. The massacre in Boapatong and even more recently in Siskai, have today become a metaphor of the struggle against apartheid, as much as Soweto was decades ago. How many more lives have to be lost? How many more families must bite the bitter fruit of violence before the South African government realizes that the campaign of terror being waged by its agents merely increases the skepticism over its real intentions? For the South African government to continue receiving the cautious approval of the international community for its agenda of political reform of its society, it must demonstrate good faith by arresting the dissent into anarchy and bringing the perpetrators of the violence to justice. Denials can no longer be seen as allaying the fears of those who fervently wish to see change come by peaceful means. Sierra Leone had therefore supported the decision of the OAU summit to bring the matter once again before the Security Council. We welcome the decision of the Council and commend the Secretary General for dispatching observers to South Africa, which demonstrated the continued concern of the international community over South Africa, with the hope that the mission will help in bringing a halt to the violence and the resumption of the talks leading to a peaceful solution of the problem. Mr. President, Southern Africa continues to be plagued with conflict, and the human cost is a grim reminder of how much more needs to be done to bring hope to the lives of the peoples of the sub-region, especially Mozambique. Too many years of conflict have done little but ravage the country and leave the people with not much to hope for. Lately, there have been some hopeful signs with the proposed ceasefire agreement. We commend the role played by the various statesmen in bringing this about and believe the United Nations should bring its experience to bear in this final phase of the conflict. It is our hope that the world community will increase its humanitarian assistance to Mozambique in view of the famine which is threatening the population now that a solution to the conflict is in sight. With the preparation underway in Angola for elections leading to a national government, it is our hope that peace will once again reign in that war-torn brotherly country. Mr. President, the makings of a great tragedy are what is today Somalia. With the raging war, the consequent massive outflow of refugees from that country, it is essential that the international con community respond much more urgently and vigorously to this catastrophe. We cannot afford to sit by and watch the people of Somalia descend into a quagmire of death and destruction. From this tribune, Sierra Leone calls on the Somali leaders to stop the war, a war which has caused so much sufferings to their people, end national suicide, and embark on a process of negotiations and reconciliation. We would like to express our appreciation to the Secretary General to have brought this tragedy to the attention of the international community. 
Mr. President, the plight of the Southern Sudanese people, though perhaps less visible and less reported, is no less tragic than those of the people of Somalia. As a result of a long-running civil war, millions of Sudanese are today languishing and facing a slow and painful death through neglect, famine, and because of military siege. Given the perils and immense sufferings facing them, we call on this organization to intensify both its efforts of humanitarian assistance and towards finding a durable solution to a civil war now going on in that brotherly country. The peoples of Somalia and Sudan require all the support of this organization and indeed of the international community as a whole in this hour of national tragedy. The present Middle East negotiations have renewed our confidence for peace in that volatile region. We allow ourselves to hope that in the peace talks now taking place, all the parties, Israelis, the Palestinians through their chosen representatives, Syrians, Jordanians, and Lebanese will work conscientiously and in good faith towards a resolution of decades of suspicion and conflict. Mr. President, what the world continues to witness in the former Yugoslavia defies human comprehension. The gravity and consequences of that war are reminiscent of the conduct the world had all but wished were only a memory. As the war continues to unfold, we may once again be facing in its insidious form the dread of racism in the former Yugoslavia, which has been euphemistically referred to as ethnic cleansing. This time should be different. We are concerned over the situation in Bosnia and Herzegovina. The world cannot afford to be silent over what may become yet another sad chapter in its history. The present ongoing efforts must be intensified to bring that conflict to a speedy conclusion and save further innocent lives. We call upon all the peoples of former Yugoslavia, peoples we so much respected and admired, to akin to our plea, to bury the hatchet and try to live in peace once more. Mr. President, in other areas of the world, the guns of war have fallen silent and peace has been given a chance. In Cambodia and Angola, there is renewed expectation and hope that peace will endure. To all of these peoples, we in Sierra Leone extend our best wishes and urge them not to be distracted from the path of peaceful solution they have embarked upon. When I started my address to this assembly, I referred to this year as being a momentous one. Few years have been as auspicious as this one. The United Nations Conference on the Environment and Development held at Rio de Janeiro this year proffered us a renewed opportunity to demonstrate our respect for the environment and ensure that our efforts at socio-economic development and the elimination of poverty should not be at the expense of the environment. And Sierra Leone welcomes and supports the call for sustainable development of the environment. Also in the course of this momentous year, we have observed a renewal of faith in the United Nations as mankind's best hope for peace security, and progress. Nowhere was this more visible than in the Security Council Summit held on 31st January. We saw life breathed into a dormant concept, a blueprint take shape, and the first steps of a long-delayed journey 
chartered. For over four decades, this organization wrestled with itself, torn between competing ideologies, becoming a helpless spectator to conflicts across the globe, paralyzed with the Cold War neurosis. Our collective actions during this period seldom bore resemblance to the vision of the Charter, embracing, as they often did, more an inclination towards the veto than inspired by, by altruistic considerations. Looking back, many will say we came through a crippling ritual, solely testing this organization's capacity for promoting conflict resolution, social progress, and better standards of life, while undermining our own faith in the efficacy of multilateralism. History may yet treat us kindly if we seize this sense of moment, seeing it as one more opportunity for all of us to give birth to the dream of the Charter. As the Secretary General observes in his report, an agenda for peace, the manifest desire of the membership to work together in a new source of strength in our common endeavor. Indeed, the road ahead may be a demanding one, replete with pitfalls, challenging the imagined metamorphosis while enticing us to return to the mentality of the past. We must, therefore, be driven by a focused determination to broaden our horizon of cooperation, acting in a manner consistent with the Charter, thus ensuring that the peoples of the world inherit the common ends envisaged by the Charter. In closing, Mr. President, I would like on behalf of my delegation and on my own account to pay tribute to our distinguished Secretary General who since his election has left no stone unturned in exerting himself to find peaceful solutions to many problems facing our world today. Mr. Secretary General, we recall our first encounter with you earlier this year in Dakar during the OAU summit. We came to appreciate your wise counsel, which we took to heart. You have been reported as a man who was born to be Secretary General. By your leadership and other qualities, you have justified the confidence which we in Africa first reposed in you and which the rest of the international community endorsed later. We wish you continued success in your mission. Finally, Mr. President, I would like once again to appeal through you to the international community for their understanding. Our intervention of April 29th was prompted by the highest of motives, the salvation of our nation. Like most of you distinguished delegates represented in this assembly, we are committed to the democratic process and to the fundamental human rights of our fellow citizens. We also happen to believe in good governance, that political power must be exercised responsibly and in the interest of those from whom it is held in trust. This is our credo. We therefore appeal to you to give us a chance to enable us to plot a new cause for our nation and its people to lay solid foundation for a genuine democratic process and to put in place a realistic program of economic recovery and survival. Mr. President, distinguished delegates, I thank you for your attention. On behalf of the General Assembly, I wish to thank the Chairman of the National Provisional Ruling Council of Sierra Leone for the statement he has just made.
I request representatives to remain seated while the Secretary General and I call the chairman. Mr. President, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, 50 years ago, after the guns fell silent, 800 delegates from 50 states in San Francisco, realizing that future generations must no more face the lessons of 1945, signed the United Nations Charter document, securing a safer future promoting the rights and freedoms of every living individual. We are the visions of those founding leaders. 135 additional states are today members of this democratic organ, embracing almost every single state on this planet. Five decades on, the dreams of those delegates at the original San Francisco conference are still shared by every single delegate here in New York. The world has changed. Giant nations are no more confronting each other with deadly weapons. The Iron Curtain has given way to closer cooperation, and the threat of nuclear annihilation has receded. Giant economic blocks are emerging, and one-time arc enemies are today close allies. These developments are paralleled with a struggle for peoples under colonialism. Hardly any former colonial territory had achieved complete independence 50 years ago, but today there is not one single state under colonial domination as the UN turns 50. The resolution of ancient and imagined new conflicts, the provision of humanitarian aid to the millions of hungry and dying peoples of the world, the UN through its agencies has grappled with. Mr. President, these are remarkable achievements sadly though restricted to the richer nations in the north. The ripples are yet to make significant impact on the poorer smaller nations in the south. While the wealthier north enjoy stability, democracy and economic prosperity, increased productivity, expanded markets and job opportunities, the underdeveloped poor wallow in debt, famine, instability, disease and death. Unfairly depressed commodity prices, plus a huge debt hang, threatening recovery for third world developing economies, capital and investment diversions to newly liberated Eastern Europe has left starved the crippling economies of the world's poorest. Africa's debt alone has moved from a staggering 200 billion United States dollars in 1993 to 211 billion dollars in 1994. Real per capita aid have fallen since 1991, and Sub-Saharan Africa's share of direct foreign investment for developing nations has hit a mere 5%. The level of overseas development cooperation is at its lowest ever. Mr. President, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, these imbalances are creating new tensions and divisions in Africa. From Kigali to Monrovia, the dark continent is beleaguered with armed conflicts. Africa's armed movements, coups toppling democracies, are the results of acute poverty. Insurgencies threaten democracies. And today, armed guerrillas are a threat to the envisaged democracy in Sierra Leone. Democratic elections are billed for the first half of next year. Speculations are that armed activities may disrupt the entire process. In early March this last year, our Secretary General appointed Ambassador Dimka, an Ethiopian, a special envoy to Sierra Leone, noting the serious security situation with the potential to complicate the Liberian peace process and destabilize the entire sub-region. 500,000 people are displaced and 
200,000 more have fled their homeland. Disease and hunger in the camps kill many daily. Refugees and displaced are desperate for relief. Rural community dislocations has left the entire electoral process with technical complexities, free and fair democratic elections a lot more expensive. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, with a dreadful guerrilla campaign confronting an IMF adjusted economy, an absence of substantial donor funding will kill democracy in Sierra Leone. Gorillas who kill peasants in remote villages, shoot cattle, set oats on fire, use drugs, and teach 12 year olds to carry AK 47s are today's terrorists. A threat to Africa's democratization and they must be isolated. Insurgents who sit and talk with governments must be urged to drop their lethal weapons and make peace. Mr. President, I salute through you our Secretary General, his staff at the Secretariat, and all previous Secretary Generals for 50 years of committed service. Let us make the UN leaner, stronger, and keep alive the vision of its founding leaders. I thank you very much.